Good morning, Light Point. Welcome to church on this beautiful Sunday. Um, if you are out in the foyer, go ahead and grab your coffee. Come on in and join us. Hi, Jim. <laughs> for those, all of you who are on the line also, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you are in the sanctuary, go ahead and stand with us, and we're going to worship. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you got. There's honey in the rock. Hard to see. Only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock. 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 Freedom where the spirit is. Bounty.
Yeah. 
chasing after us, even when we don't deserve it. Help us to all have open hearts and open minds that hear what you truly are. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. You may have a seat. Welcome. I am Jacqueline. I'm the communications director here at Light Point Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. Um, if you are new, our students in grades 6 through 12 have a class that exits out this way. If you are interested, we would love to have you join our group. Um, also, if you're new, we have a connection card. We would love to gather your information and just connect with you, um, send you a card just to say, hey, thanks for being here today. I'm not going to show up on your doorstep, um, <laughs> but we have a gift we would love to exchange um, for your card and just would love to connect and keep in touch with you. Um, and next Sunday, I'm going to be hosting a Realm Help Session. So if Realm is a challenge for you, I would love for you to come. We're going to keep it simple just for the basic things that you need to know how to do on the app. I say if you can run and work Facebook, you can work Realm. <laughs> and I know many of us in here are on Facebook, so if you can do Facebook, you can do Realm. Um, so I would love to have you join me for that. If you have not signed up, there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center, or you can sign up through Realm and RSVP on the event. And that is one of the things we'll be learning next week is how to RSVP for an event. <laughs> um, and then lastly, oh no, we have two more announcements. The ladies pool party is coming up. This is our annual pool party over at Mama Julie's home in Goshen. We'll be having just a very light lunch and a fun afternoon, um, just a fellowship and relaxing, floating in the water. Um, so we would love for you to join us ladies. Um, you can sign up at the Welcome Center or also on Realm. And lastly, the Cincinnati Reds Faith Day concert is coming up. So on Saturday, April, the, or not April, August the 5th, uh, at 410, the Reds are going to play the Washington Nationals, which, of course, I know we've all heard about how great the Reds have been doing, if you haven't been watching. Um, so they're going to play at 410, and then 20 minutes after the game ends, for King and Country is going to perform. And the tickets are $21. That includes both the game and the concert. So we are putting a pretty hard deadline of RSVPing for this event by next Sunday so that we can get as many tickets as we need all together. Um, so if you are interested, please sign up at the Welcome Center. You can register on Realm and pay on Realm if that's easier. You can write a check or put cash in an offering envelope and just drop it in the offering bins and just write Red's Game on it so we know what it's for. Um, if you have any questions, just check in with us at the Welcome Center. And with that, we have a video. Thank you. 
recommendation found by the vision changed by virtue and consumed by selfishness was an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. This is the third thing. The Bible tells us we're called to be brave, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly in love. to put this in my mind. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time to recognize that true independence is found only in our lasting dependence on God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hey, good morning. How's everybody? Am I good? Good. I'm glad. It's good to see you guys. I've missed my church. I've been gone for a few weeks. I've had a wonderful time uh, with family and, and uh, hanging out with uh, Josh at some lacrosse tournaments, and and it, so it's been it's been interesting. I learned something. Here's what I learned. I am not a good fan. I have control issues. <clears throat> And I know better than everyone. I'm just kidding. But no, I learned that uh, being a fan for my son, I, I, I have a hard time. I like cheering him on. But then, uh, anyway, we'll just leave it at that. So the best thing, though, over the past couple of weeks that I got to do was I, I love and I cherish one-on-one time with my kids. And one of the things we was able to do is uh, Josh and I were able to get away uh, for, for a weekend to, to Indianapolis for a tournament. And we just kind of made sure that we focused in on just hanging out as dad and son and getting to pour into, uh, get me getting a chance to pour into them. And the, one of the coolest things is I found out is my boy loves to eat. And his dad loves to eat. So we're sitting at Longhorn Steakhouse and I said, hey buddy, um, what are you thinking? I said, you can order you know, whatever you want. All good. And he goes, dad, I want a slab of ribs. And I'm like, like, buddy, why don't we, we just had wings, why don't we just go with a half a slice? He goes, but dad, it's only $6 more, and then we can save it for a snack later. He's really good at math. So then, dessert time comes, and so the lady comes out and says, hey, do y'all want dessert? And I said, and I kind of looked at him, he goes, oh yeah. He goes, I want the molten lava cake. And he goes, Dad, look at the picture. It doesn't look that big. And so I'm looking at him like, sucker's bigger than your head, but okay. So sure enough, they bring it out, and he just looks. And he goes, this is awesome. And it was, uh, I took a picture. I probably should show it to you. I took a picture, and that sucker, like, his head went missing behind it. And, uh, it but he just dug right into it. And he goes, Dad, you going to eat this with me? And I'm like, no, I want to see how far he'll go with this. Anyway. So I had a great time. I appreciate Aaron filling in for me and uh, all the staff and you guys stepping up and doing everything. And of course, my church family who I love and cherish y'all stepping in and making sure things run and all of that good stuff. If you missed it, we just wrapped up uh, our first round of workshops this past uh, Thursday, which was awesome. And we had uh, some new family stop in and new kids. And so that was awesome. It was great to see that. And everybody that... Uh, was a part of that. I appreciate you. I heard some amazing things that uh, was able to happen during that time and the interactions. And so uh, I was very happy. And so just July's coming. And so if you want to be a part of that, please let Aaron know. Uh, I'm sure extra help and all that good stuff's good. But what I want to do is now is we're going to uh, continue in our series called The Trap. And we were uh, coming out of a series called Created by Design. And so in this piece, we, we moved on in Genesis to this piece of the trap of sin and how the evil one is out to trap us and out to get us caught up in our sin and to bring about destruction and bring about this fall that, that continues, that we see the effects of more and more, uh, even more so today as a, the snowball tends to be getting bigger and the momentum of sin and destruction tends to be coming more, not to depress us, but one thing we need to remember is that we do live in a free country. No matter what you hear, no matter what goes on, there is freedom and we have it. The question is, are we going to exercise our freedom or are we going to kowtow 
to, the, to, to loudness and to things that people tell us we need to. And so one thing we have to do as a church, as a church body, as followers of Christ, is we have to start recognizing the deception of the evil one. And we have to start reacting in a way that's loving, but also brings truth. And we don't need to apologize for it. We don't need to apologize for it. Because the reality of it is, is even though what's happening is temporary, because one day Jesus will come, and one day he'll bring his church back home, and one day he'll come and reign. And those that follow him will be with him, and those that don't, don't won't, will be distant from the Father, separated from the Father for eternity. And that's eternal consequences. And it is our job as a church, as believers, to speak truth and to do it in a loving way that attracts more and more people to a loving Father. And so as we get into this, I want us to understand that there's something that happens in us as believers that happens to all people. Last week, Aaron was in the passage with Cain and Abel, and there's this piece in it that was very interesting. It was the past, and, and Greg, I know you're back there. If you'll actually go uh, to uh, Genesis chapter 4, 6, and 7, it's a few slides down. So if you'll go there with me real quick. I want to read this passage that Aaron wrapped up on last week, and I want to use it as our starting point into today. And it's this. There we go. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And this was right after Cain brought his offering and, and God accepted Abel and not his. And so there's this peace in, in Cain that anger started to rise up and God noticed it. Now let me ask you something. Uh, let's take a poll here. How many of us think anger is bad? Okay. How many of us think anger is a God-given emotion? What we do with anger is bad. Why we get angry determines whether it's righteous or unrighteous. We need to be very careful in our world today to determine and deem that all anger is bad. Because it's not. We are given basic emotions that God has given us to help us navigate life, to enjoy life, to experience life, that going out and de determining that one is bad over the other, and one's better over the other, we fall into this trap of deeming we can't get to this point, when actually anger is not bad in itself. It's why we're angry, and then what we choose to do with the anger. Is that, fair? Is that clear? We good? Okay, so let's go here. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? So this anger has trapped Cain and it's kind of got him down and it's got this huge impact on him and, and it's causing some very serious issues with Cain. And so he goes on and, and it says this, and God says in seven, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, check this, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Meaning this, anger is right there. If you don't deal with it in a healthy way, if you don't address it in a healthy way, in a godly way, it's crouching right there to take over you. It's right there to get the better of you. It's right there to cause problems in the home. It's right there to cause problems in society. It's right there to wreak destruction in everything it faces. And so in this piece, we have to understand that from the very beginning, from this fall that, that happened after, after Cain presented something to the God and, and, and he didn't give his best and he didn't do what he needed to do, there's this piece in this that all of a sudden something started happening with, with Cain and anger started bubbling up. The other piece with this is Cain was also, there, you got to look at it in this way, is, well, I didn't do as well as my brother, or my brother's offering was accepted and mine wasn't, so there's a comparison game going on with Cain. Now let me ask you this, is, do we like to play the comparison game? I can tell you right now, a lot of us do. I sat here the other day watching the soccer clinic go on, and Jason Merkel and Jeff Monholland did a phenomenal job 
But I sat here and watched two boys, my kids, sit there and argue about who won and who didn't and who cheated and who didn't. So I know very well that we like to play the comparison game from a young age. It, it, it just happens. And we do it as well. We get on social media and we look at what great vacation somebody went on or what great time someone had. And, and what we need to realize is, guys, that's just a snippet of somebody's life. That's just a snippet of that vacation. They don't show you the argument that happened when they were packing. They don't show you the argument that happened when they were in the car or in the airport. They don't show you the frustration that someone had of uh, pulling out their credit card or their, their wallet to pay for something. Like, they don't show you all. They just show the sun and the beach and all this stuff. And then we're like, well, I want that. And then when we, we, we don't have it, that we play the comparison game and we start to this. So we see a, a couple and they, they got all their kids and everyone looks smiling and, and they don't show you the rock that was thrown at their brother right before the camera was snapped. And has that ever happened to you guys? We did a photo shoot one time and Josh or Chad picked up a rock and he chucked it at somebody, it nailed them. And it was right before we were, it was awesome. It wasn't that funny, but it, it is now. Anyway, they don't show this stuff. You just get the glimpses. So here's what we need to do. We need to stop doing this because within it, this, this trap, this anger, this comparison piece comes up. And then so when we don't check our anger and we don't put it in light of, of what God has for us and we don't, don't deal with it in a healthy way, there's something that comes up right behind it. It's called bitterness. And bitterness will wreak havoc on your lives. Bitterness will divide you. From those you love, bitterness will bring resentment. Bitterness will cause so much destruction if you don't check it and get it in check and deal with it. And that's just the thing that we get to walk through today is to see how bitterness divided, caused issues, and caused somebody to run from God. And so let's jump into our passage today. I titled today's message, Bitterness, because I think it's such, it's titled The Trap of Bitterness. And I think bitterness is so destructive, and it's, and it's a huge issue that in our society. It's a huge issue in our church. It's a huge issue in our family. If, if we don't come to grips with it, and we don't deal with it. So let's jump into Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 to 16. So the scripture says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you in strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any, any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And as we get into this, I want us to kind of, I want us to pick out on some things that happen when we let bitterness take over our lives. See, I believe, yes, God pointed to Cain's anger. And I believe Cain had some anger issues. That's why he did what he did. But I believe what he did is Cain didn't deal with those anger issues in a healthy way, in a, in a godly way. And bitterness came up and he acted out and he harmed people around him. And then also bitterness drove, made Cain decide to run from God. And so let's get into this as we walk through this. Here's what we need to understand. Is that bitterness will lead you to, to hurt those close to you. When we allow anger to go unchecked and we allow bitterness to grow and bitterness to become real in our lives, it will cause you, it will lead you to hurt those close to you. It will lead you to hurt those that you love the most. It's, that's just the simple truth of it. And you need to understand what happens and you need to understand what's going on. And so here's how it works. Somebody will do something to offend you or you think offends you. 
and all of a sudden you become offended. And just so you know, we do live in a society that has a right to be offended. And so everybody and anybody gets offended by everything. If you wear the wrong clothing, you get offended. What, I mean, it's just whatever, right? And so, can't even explain it nowadays. But everybody gets offended. And when we get offended or we choose to be offended, and that's really the case here, when we choose to be offended, all of a sudden this anger starts coming up. And when that anger starts popping up, if we don't address it, and let me be clear, we either take two options. And our two options is this. We either go in all-out fight mode and we attack those that anger us or that offended us and we go right at them or we go into flight mode because that's the way our brains are wired and that's the way we react and we go into flight mode and we avoid. Y'all see this in the house? Y'all see this in families? For, by all means, don't talk about the, the elephant in the room in your family. Because that will cause a whole lot of issues around Christmas, right? Can I just say I, I strongly disagree with that. And I'll tell you why. There was a season in, in Julie and I's life when uh, mom and dad lived in Memphis. And they would travel and they would stay with us and we loved having them. But there was a tension that seemed to be in our home. Whenever they would come, there was this tension and I couldn't understand it. There was even a time that Thanksgiving dinner was being cooked and a question was asked and tensions flared and the question was about a baking dish. And I get a look and I realize in that look I need to step into the kitchen and help out. That was the Thanksgiving I decided to cook Thanksgiving. Anyway, all of this to say the tension just started coming. And it was comments from one end or the other. It was things that, uh, promises that were made that didn't get fulfilled on, on my end. And, and uh, so it wasn't, just, we, it wasn't just one side or the other. It was a mixture of all of this. And so I'm in the middle of counseling school and I said, hey, we need to address this. Y'all remember this? Good. <laughs> so we're sitting in the living room and they had visited. And I said, we need to address this. We need to, the, I don't like this. I, this is not good for our family. And so we sat in the living room, and so we started talking things out. And what we did is we put everything out in the light, and the mo one of the most amazing things is my dad, who says very little, said, brought up something I had done, something I had done that I dropped the ball and something, didn't follow through on something, and he, he brought it up. And to me, that was the best thing that could have happened with our relationship, is rather than hold things in and, and all of this, we got it all out in the open. And since that time, every time with all of this, the relationship between Julie and I and my parents has changed for the better. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still issues, right? There's still, you rub each other, like all that. But the relationship is far better because we chose to bring stuff out in the light rather than to keep it in the dark. But as families, for some reason, we think, ah, oh, just hide it, just avoid it. And then when we avoid it and we, we run from it, we flee from it, that bitterness starts to grow. And it starts to go. Cain, when he wanted to avoid, when he wanted to, when he was dealing with his anger, Rather than go to God and tell him and have an all-out conversation with God about what was going on and all of this, and God even called him out on it. Deal with this. You got this going and the bitterness rose. And so out of this, he didn't deal with it, he didn't cope with it, he didn't address it, he didn't go at it, he didn't do it. He, no, he avoided it and he let it fester. And then all of a sudden, what does he do? Well, well let's look at it. Verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel, and, and what did he do? Killed him. Took his life. Took his life because God chose to, to his offering over his. Like, there's no great, to me, there's nothing greater he could have done to his brother than take his life to say, nope, you're not living anymore. But see, here's the thing too. In our world, we try to do the same thing to people. 
We just don't do it in a way to where we take their life literally. We try to do it to where we get at them and we start pestering them. We start coming at them. We start attacking them to where it's like a death by a thousand cuts. And all of this stuff that happens and then somebody walks around defeated because if someone attacks them and attacks them and attacks them because a bitterness goes in, is going on. And at some point it's got to stop. And so we get to this point where Cain, it doesn't stop for him, and he gets to this point where he can't take it anymore, and the bitterness that has come out of that anger he has causes him to take Abel's life. And so in this, there's a part in Scripture in the, in the New Testament that, got, that uh, Scripture points right to it. So go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's writing this, and he, goes, and he goes right at this, because I think this is something we need to understand as Christ followers, as believers, as those that belong to Jesus, given our lives to Jesus, have chosen to follow Him, have chosen to, to ask Him for forgiveness, and, and given our lives to Him. There's a piece of this that we need to understand. There is a task, there is something we need to do deliberately in order to deal with this, and it says this in Ephesians 4, 31-32. Let all bitterness and wrath, ready? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. What Paul's saying is deal with this, get it away from you, address it, come at it. Whatever you got to do, don't let it fester. Don't let it build up. Address it. Why do we want that? Has anybody ever dealt with bitterness? Anybody? Do you feel good when you're in it? Does it bring life to you? No. But for some reason we get comfortable in it. And we hold on to it. And then we go at people around us that we love for whatever reason. And it causes so many issues and it causes so much destruction and it causes so many things that happen that are not good. Here's what what happens when we choose to not deal with it and we not choose to do this. You guys keep my counseling business running when you do it. The flow of people coming in my office day in, day out, I don't lack for clients. And it's because we're not getting this whole peace. And it's just not the secular, it's Christians. It's people who come in and say they belong to Christ. And they come in and they have all this stuff they haven't dealt with. And they can't do, and then it just, it keeps keeps going on and on. And it passes down from generation to generation. But Paul comes at it. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Now here's where he goes after this in 32. What does he say? Be kind to one another. So kind. Notice it doesn't say nice. It says kind. There's a difference. Huge difference. Kind, there, there's, with being kind, there's a, a truth and a grace piece that gets intermixed. With niceness, it's just this, this, this almost like this, this facade that's put on and that we, we're just going to be nice, but in, underneath we, we haven't dealt with stuff. But he says, be kind to one another. He says, tender-hearted. In other words, be, allow your heart to be soft towards other people. And yes, you're going to say, well, Chad, if I do that, then I open myself up to vulnerability and being vulnerable and allowing somebody to harm me or allowing somebody to hurt me. And I would say, yes, you do. When you open yourself up to somebody, and you're not guarded, you, you make yourself vulnerable. But there's no better place to be in God's eyes than being soft and, and in a place where, but and that allows us to interact in a healthy way. But he goes on and he says this, and we need to catch this. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now you may sit here and say, well, Chad, you don't understand what's been done to me. You don't understand what they did. You don't understand the hurt that was caused. You, don't, you, you have no idea the gravity of what they've done. And I would tell you that I've sat in the room with so many people who have shared the most awful things 
that could happen to an individual and the most awful things that could, a, a dad could do to their child or an uncle or whatever it may be that has been done to somebody. And I can tell you I've heard it and I can't tell you that I've been there and experienced it, but I can tell you I've heard pretty much everything, which is why I don't allow my kids to do sleepovers. But that's another point. So with that, I've heard a lot. And what I tell people is after, not off the bat, but after a period of time, what I'll share with people is until you can get to a point of forgiving them, you'll never break free from where you're at. And so then we walk through this forgiveness piece. See, I think Cain had to do something because Cain was dealing with two things here. He was dealing with his brother and, and feeling wronged and offended by his brother because he gave a better gift. That God chose God, his gift over, the, over him. And the other thing I think Cain was dealing with, and have you ever done, done this, guys? Get angry towards God? Something doesn't go right. Something doesn't happen, and so you get angry towards God. And so your anger boils over towards him. And so there's this piece that you have to learn that you have to get to this point where you're trusting him. And in a part of it where you're releasing God of anything you think he owes you. Because the reality of it is he's already given you enough. He's already given you exactly what you need. And his name is Jesus. And if we could just focus on that and the fact that we're given him and that he was a gift. And that when we receive him, we receive forgiveness. But see, here's the piece we need to understand that in order to understand what this forgiving piece is, in order for us to get to this point, is we've got to stop comparing ourselves to each other or to that guy that may be worse than me or maybe a little better than me. And I've got to stop playing the comparison game with my fellow brother or sister in Christ or, or a heathen or whatever you want to say. And, and I've got to start comparing myself to Christ. And where do I fall short with him? Because the reality of it is, is no matter who we are, we all fall short of Christ. And it's because of that we need forgiveness. And so when we can stand and look at how much we've been forgiven about who Christ is and how much we've been forgiven, it sure does make it a lot easier for us to look at the people around us and start forgiving them for what they've done. And here the short of forgiveness is this, is I'm going to choose to release that person of anything they owe me. Because when I'm offended and I'm wronged, I feel like someone owes me. You owe me an apology. I want you to grovel. I want you to come to me with whatever. And I want you to make it up to me day in and day out till I feel better. And until I get that, until I, I'm not going to forgive you. And I can tell you that's the worst attitude and thought to have. Forgiveness is not about them. Forgiveness is about you and your heart. And so when you release them, you don't owe me anything. I forgive you. And I realize some of you are going to say, Chad, but you don't understand. I say, I don't, but Jesus does. And all the times we've fallen short, he's released us of anything we've owed him, and he's paid the debt for us. And it's because of that we can look at people around us and do the same. Now, that does not mean we have to go back into a best friend relationship with somebody like that and allow them to keep hurting us. Does that make sense? That does not mean that the wound is not there. The scar tissue of that wound isn't going to be there. It will always be there. What it means is I'm going to continue to release them and forgive them. And so in this piece, Cain needed to get to a point where he needed to deal with the bitterness. He needed to get away from him. He needed to get to this point where, one, he released God of thinking God owed him anything. And he needed to release Abel of anything that he thought Abel owed him for showing him up to God. And so we get to this piece. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it that no one falls, fails to obtain the grace of God. And check this. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes what? Do we see it yet? Bitterness. What it causes. And by it, many become defiled. The author of Hebrews points right to it. Don't let it spring up. Deal with it. Here's what happened. Cain didn't. Caused them to lead to, to harm somebody. Second thing is, as we walk through this, bitterness 
uh, will lead you to not be honest with God. I want us to check what Cain did. Cain did this, and uh, we get to read about it in verse 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is, you, where is Abel your brother? I love this. God asks some questions. It's almost like he's trying to trap you. Where's your brother? And you're like, God, you know where he's at. But God asked him anyway. I think God likes to hear our, how we're going to respond. It's kind of like when I catch one of my kids doing something stupid. And I look at them and I ask them a question. And my favorite is when they say, what? And I'm like, I stood right here and watched you. You're going to what me? And they go, what did I do? And I'm like, you tell me what you, and we get in this, it's, anyway. We can be like that with God sometimes. What I do? You know exactly what you did. You chose to follow yourself rather than him. Comes on and he says this, where's your brother Abel? And he said, I did not know. He knew exactly where Abel was at. He just took his life. Am I my brother's keeper? He got defensive. I'm not, I'm not, it's not my responsibility to know where he's at. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. God comes right at it and says, look, I know exactly what's going on. And your response that you just presented, and, and Cain, let's just be honest, Cain had a, a, another response he could have come at at this, right? Because we always have choices. Always. You always have a choice on how you respond to something that's been done wrong. And Cain had the very same thing. We read this story and how Cain responded, but there was another way he could have come at this. And he could have got down on his knees and he could have asked God for forgiveness for what he'd done, admitted it to him, and, and, that, and there may be a bit different outcome or whatever happens, right? But the reality of it is, is he didn't respond in any way other than telling God, I don't know. And I don't, as he's not my responsibility. So he lied to God, and then he got defensive. When bitterness sets into our hearts, we're going to not be honest with God, and we're going to come be very defensive about our actions. It happens. Well, God, they did this to me, and this happened, and whatever, and this is why I act. No, 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 no. Stop. We get to this point, you remember in Acts chapter 5, and you go and read about Ananias and his wife. And there was this piece where Ananias, I think, wanted to be, wanted to be in my belief, he wanted to be recognized for doing something amazing because all these other people were. So he's playing the comparison game. And so what did he do? He went and sold some land, and he, he decided, I'm going I'm, I'm to go give the, the profits from this land sale to the, to the church. And so what does he do? So in all of this, and there's this peace that was building up in Ananias, if you read the story, that you can see that something wasn't right with his heart. Why? Because he, he went into the church and he was presenting the offering to the, the apostles and they, and they said, hey, is this the full amount? And he lied. And he goes, yeah. And right then he drops dead. And his wife, who was aware of all of it, comes in. And, and so again, something going on in her heart, something that was, hasn't been checked, uh, again, I believe that she's playing the comparison game and, and there's some stuff going on that, that caused this to go because why else would she do it? Goes in and knew about what had taken place, knew what was going to go down, and she goes in and lies, drops dead. So there's this piece that I think once we, we don't check our hearts and we don't do this, we start to do things that are deceitful and we start to do things out of, out of a, a, a broken heart that, that, that cause destruction, that cause us to not be honest. Not only with, with ourselves, but honest with God. And here's what I want to understand. When we allow our hearts to get that way, Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I love this passage because it points to the fact that our hearts, when not in line with God's, can be very deceptive can lead us further and further away from Him, can justify actions that, that don't honor God, that can justify selfishness that aren't in His presence. So with this, we learn that bitterness will lead us to hurt somebody close to us, will lead us to not be honest with God, and will also lead us to unwanted consequences. Now we get to this piece where we see unwanted consequences in verse 11 to 12. 
And so, and so it says, and now you are cursed from the ground which is open. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay attention to exactly what God says to Cain and then how Cain responds. Pay attention to what God specifically says to Cain and then how Cain responds and what Cain believed he heard. Okay, is that fair? Here we go. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And so God goes on. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So he's coming right at, at Cain saying, look, this is what's going to happen to the ground that you till. You're going to have a lot of issues. Not only that, but you're never going to be settled. You're going to have this peace in you that's driving you to wander and driving you to, to, to kind of keep moving around and never get to a place where you, can, you, you feel, feel at peace. And so in this piece, what we understand or what we can see is God gives him a consequence and here's how he responds. And if you go with me uh, to the next 13 and, and 15, what happens is a lot of times when we get an unwanted consequence or there's a consequence, because let's be honest, we need to have consequences to the times we mess up. There needs to be a consequence if, if we do something wrong. Otherwise, we don't wake up to what the, the, those things that we're falling short on. But what happens is I think a lot of times we catastrophize. And I believe bitterness will lead us to catastrophizing. And catastrophizing means this, that I'm going to think the worst and I'm going to allow my mind and my brain and my thoughts to go to worst case scenario and the, and the worst of the worst and that's where it's going. And a part of it is, you could say, is a part of the consequence. But Cain adds something in here that I think is very key to this passage. Let's read it. In 13 to 15, it says this. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. May be true. He may not be ready for it. But he goes on and says this. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground. Now catch this. What does it say next? And your face, and, and from your face I shall be hidden. Where did God say that? Where did God say that? God didn't tell him that. God said you're going to have issues with the ground, yes. God said you're going to be a wanderer. But God, didn't, that God did not say that piece. And so in this we start, and guess who else added to Scripture? Wasn't it Cain's mom, Eve, who added something during that story, that interaction? And so we see that a lot of times when we allow bitterness to go on, we start catastrophizing and we start uh, to getting in this peace. Now here's the, the reality of it is sin is going to cause God, the, the separation between us and God, absolutely. But in this piece, God also, throughout Adam and Eve's story, he provided a way for there to continue to be a relationship. In the fall, there was this way that God provided so that there could, and I honestly believe that if Cain's response would have been a different, that there could have been a different way God approached it. But this is the story we have, so this is what we have to deal with. And so in this, we see that in all of this, there comes a point where he adds something to it, and he says this, I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And what, ready? In another way, catastrophizing. And whoever finds me will kill me. So all of a sudden he gets to a point where he starts fearing for his life. He starts to realize the magnitude of his sin and starts to fear for his own life and worried that someone's going to take it out on him. And here's how God responds. Then the Lord said to him, not so. Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And I want you to catch this. In the midst of something was, that was horrible, a life was taken. In the midst of all of this, God still provided protection for Cain. Don't understand it. Don't get it. But what I see is a loving God who loves his children even when they screw up. 
And so in this piece, yes, there's consequences to our stuff. There's all this, but that shouldn't allow bitterness to keep rising because we can always come back to a loving God. Go with me to Colossians 3, 1 to 4. It says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, and so when the minute we give our lives to Christ, we've been raised with Him. Seek what? Seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Two, set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Look, when we get into these things and start catastrophizing and start thinking everything's worse than what it is and we just get in this spiral and we just start spiraling out of control, what we need to do is we need to train our minds to go back to what? To setting our things on the things above, setting our mind on things above, getting back to this place where we see Christ and we see how much he loves us and see how much he, he desires a relationship for with us. So set your minds on things that, that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's a promise there. When we choose to take our mind and set it on Christ, when we choose to set our eyes on him, when we choose to not look at all the crud that's going on and all this stuff, and we say, nope, my eyes are going to be focused on you. My thoughts are going to be focused on you. It's not as bad as it seems because I've got you. When we get to this point where all we need is Jesus, then all everything else falls to the side. Everything. And so when we start getting in this spiral, how horrible life is, and all the things that are going wrong, remember what Scripture says. Set your mind on Him. Put your mind on things above. And allow Him to transform the way you think and the situation you're in. Because there's a promise there that he says when we do this, that eventually we get to appear with him in glory. And that's the promise when we continue to come back to him. There's a peace that comes that surpasses all understanding. Here's the thing we need to do as we close. When we allow bitterness to come in, guys, and we allow it to take over and we hurt people around us, we choose to not be honest with God, we start catastrophizing, thinking everything is going on, the last thing that happens is this. As if you go to the passage, here's what takes place. It says this. Uh, bitterness will lead you to distance yourself from God. Verse 16, what do we learn? In 16 it says this. Then Cain went what? He went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain chose to remove himself from the presence of the Lord. So I'm done. I'm out. When we allow bitterness to take over, when we stop putting our thoughts and our minds and our setting ourselves uh, on Christ, we distance ourselves more and more from our Father who loves us. And so I don't care what we've done. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what's happened to you. There's a promise in Scripture. <clears throat> Romans 8, 37 to 39, one of my favorite. Now in all, th now notice it doesn't say in some things. Now in all things. What? Now in? Really? Now in? That was better. Now in all things, things are more than, we are more than conquerors through him who what? For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor, what does it say? That's the crap that's been done to you. That's the bitterness that you won't let go of. Anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from what? The love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a Father who gave us Jesus. Who sent His Son on this earth to free us from any bitterness we may have. Who set the tone for us. 
who after we read through the Old Testament and realize how things went down and how bitterness came out and caused so much destruction, and yet even today when bitterness rises up and somebody offends us, one of the things we do is we run from God. Why? When we know that his passages and his word tells us that he, nothing will separate us from his love, nothing will take us away from that, and yet we choose over and over again to remove ourselves from his presence. And as a loving father, he's right there waiting for us to come back to him, to set our minds on him, and allow him to transform us. And so today, if you don't know who Jesus is, today's the day to give your life to him. Today's the day to say, I want that bitterness out. I want that forgiveness that you offer. And I don't want anything to separate me from you. So God, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and to save me from my sins. To forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. And I pray, God, that you would change my life and that I wouldn't get in your way. Lord, help me to deal with the bitterness in a way that honors you. Help me learn to forgive as you've forgiven me. And in this, we can start to see a change in our lives. The change that only comes from who Jesus is. The author and perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we praise you. <clears throat> we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you, God, that you love us so much. <clears throat> you love us so much that you don't want us trapped in bitterness and unforgiveness. You love us so much that in even the midst of the catastrophizing and think that all is going down, you are still there and you still love us. Lord, thank you for this allowing us to know the story of Cain. And for allowing us to see your love even in the midst of something horrible. So God, as we deal with our own bitterness in our hearts. Lord, may you remind us of your love for us and your forgiveness of us. And may we take that and do the same to those around us. God, we love you and we praise you. And I ask, Father, that you'd work in my life that you'd work in my family, and that you'd work in this church family that you've blessed me with. God, I love you and I praise you, and I ask, Father, that you'd move in an amazing way. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. A couple ways for us to respond today. The communion tables are right back here, and if today may be the day is you need to remember what Jesus did for you. Maybe you need to remember how much you've been forgiven. And because you need to remember how much you for, are forgiven so that it can help you go and forgive those around you, maybe today you need to go back and take communion and remember that his blood was shed for you and that his life was given for you so that you can have forgiveness, that you can have be cleaned by his blood. And so you can do that in remembrance of what he has done for. And out of that, allow you to walk that out with those around you and living a life of forgiveness. Second way is by giving. We believe here at Light Point that God blesses us in so many ways. And because he blesses us, a way of trusting him, a way of being obedient to him, and a way of honoring him, we, we have our offering bins back, and you can respond by giving today uh, your, through tithes and offerings. Uh, I'll be over here if you need prayer. If you gave your life to Christ today or want to know more about what that is, if you're online, join us today. Welcome. And if you need to give your life to Christ or want to know more, please email us, info at lightpoint.church. But if you're here today, I'll be right over here, happy to pray with you, happy to walk out what it means to give your life to Christ, follow Jesus, I'd love to do that with you. Um, and then lastly, we're going to stand and sing as a church family. And so you respond exactly how God leads. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll. What 
So, Father God, thank you that when we are with you and we belong to you, our souls can be made well. And so whatever we've got going on today, whatever we've got going on in our lives, Lord, may we come to you willing to be vulnerable to you, willing to open it all up. And Lord, more importantly, may we be willing to be obedient to what you tell us to do with it. Whether that's hard conversations whether that's being open and honest in a loving and truthful way. God, may we be willing to walk that out in a way that honors you. And through that, Lord, may we experience a freedom like no other. Freedom only found in belonging to you. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful fourth. I pray you guys stay safe. Um, and enjoy the 4th, and we will see you guys next Sunday. Love you guys.